church. If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and get those out right now. We are going to be in the book of Amos. We're going to be wrapping up the series that we've been in for the last couple of weeks, looking at the minor prophet who came from the southern kingdom and got called by God to go to the northern kingdom to to speak his words. And if you've been with us at all this year as a whole, We've, we've mentioned a couple of times from stage that we've been sort of looking at all of our message series this year through this lens of voices, through this theme of voices, and we've been really looking at some of the maybe more overlooked voices uh, in the canon of Scripture. So, you know, there's a lot of voices that we can hear out in our worlds, in our social media feeds, uh, at our jobs, in our homes. There's a lot of voices that we can tune into. And so we've really been trying to intentionally look at some of those, those voices, like I said, in the canon of Scripture. And that's sort of led our series. That's sort of led the, uh, what we have chosen to, to preach and to teach on uh, during the calendar year of 2024. You maybe remember way back when, back in February, we were in another minor prophet, Habakkuk. And then another Old Testament voice that we got to hear from was the, uh, the writer, is what he refers to himself as. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we heard the voice of Ecclesiastes. And then some New Testament uh, works that we got to, to hear from were the books of Second Timothy and Second Peter and listening to those voices. And if you remember those, you'll maybe remember that the voice that we heard in the prophet Habakkuk, it was this voice of teaching us how to wait, uh, wrestling with life in the meantime. How do we, as a follower of Jesus, wait for what God has promised given our current circumstances? The book of Ecclesiastes, the voice that we heard, was one of endless pursuits. How do we make sense of life when it seems like everything we're doing is meaningless. And then the New Testament voices, like I said, Second Timothy and Second Peter. Uh, Timothy, he encouraged us to endure, to hold on, to, to hold steadfast to the faith. And Peter encouraged us to grow in grace and to grow in knowledge as we wait. And this thematic exploration of different voices in Scripture, it's now led us to this voice, the voice of the prophet Amos. And as we close this book this morning, I want to wrestle with one question. I want to ask one question, and that is, where is hope found? Where is hope found? I love what Corbin said during his communion reflection, this idea of judgment and hope. And in a in a time, in a season, especially uh, that we are currently in, as we get a little bit closer to November, it can feel a little hopeless. And so just a quick little recap, if you haven't been with us, if this is your first Sunday here, uh, welcome, we're glad you're here. If you're watching us online for the first time, glad you, you've stumbled to us. But the book of Amos, like I mentioned, Amos is our prophet. Uh, that, uh, it's his voice that we're trying to hear from and lean into. And Amos, even if it appears at the end of your Old Testament, he was actually one of the first prophetic voices in the historical timeline of Scripture. Uh, some scholars would even think that Amos came before Isaiah or all the other voices. Um, so Amos is one of the first biblical prophets that we have. And like I said, he originally hails from the southern kingdom. So remember, uh, God's chosen people, they've uh, come out of Egypt. They've established their, their place in the promised land. And they've since gone through this sort of civil, uh, civil war split up. And so there's the northern kingdom called Israel. There's the southern kingdom called Judah. Judah, which is where Amos is from. That's a lot of the Old Testament locations that we're probably familiar with. Bethlehem, uh, Jerusalem, those are all in the southern kingdom. That's where Amos is from. Uh, but God calls him to leave his people, to leave his nation, and to go north and to speak his words to the northern kingdom. Israel. And Amos speaks mostly for the first eight and a half chapters. <clears throat> he speaks words of judgment to Israel, mainly for their neglect of the covenant that they entered into with God at Mount Sinai when God brought them out of Egypt. So at Sinai, at Egypt, they, they made promises, they exchanged vows. That's been language that I've always been able to, to maybe understand it a little bit easier. They've made these vows and these covenant promises to each other, and Israel has broken their side of the agreement. They've broken their promises, and specifically, 
God's people in the northern kingdom, they have neglected uh, to take care of those that are the most easy and uh, often overlooked in their society, the alien, the widow, the orphan, and the lowly among them. And so here comes this prophet from the south uh, to speak words of judgment and how it's on the horizon and it's going to be seen uh, a couple of years later through the Assyrian Empire. And if we were to put ourselves into the shoes of Amos's audience, if we were to uh, maybe take our nice shoes off and put ourselves into the, the sandals or the slides that they would have been wearing then, uh, it's a little easy to see why they would be asking a question similar to this. Amos, you've come, you've given us these messages, and if we're going to take you seriously, where is there, how is there hope? Where is the hope found as God's chosen people? And I don't know about you, but the more we've gone through this series and the more that this year has even gone on, uh, it's easy to resonate myself with this question. Where is hope found? But I'm reminded that despite our cultural climate, despite the season that we currently find ourselves in, Hope is possible and hope can be found. And I think the passage that we're going to end with this morning will give us a good insight into that. And, and let me just preface this, that just because I get to get up here and give my thoughts and ideas about Scripture, it doesn't mean I have it all figured out. It doesn't mean I'm perfectly practicing my discipleship to Jesus. Myself, just like most of you, I'm just trying to figure it out each and every day, uh, trying to glorify and honor Jesus in every decision that I make. And sometimes I mess up. Sometimes I get it wrong. If you don't believe me, ask the students. Uh, if you don't believe them, then you, then you can ask my wife. Um, but I promise you, you'll get 40 more voices if you ask the students. So, But while it's easy to feel hopeless, it's just as easy to figure out why we feel hopeless, especially as we think about this theme of voices and all the voices that we can tune into. Um, not a lot of people I feel like listen, or at least I don't. I'm not going to speak generally, I guess, but I don't really listen to my radio anymore. So I don't hear a lot of radio voices. Maybe you still listen to your talk shows on the radio. That's awesome. But I listen to my phone when I'm driving, and one of the, the dominating voices that I hear like in my car are the podcasts that I choose to listen to. Maybe you have a podcast that you like to listen to or a radio show that you like to listen to. Another voice that you may listen to or lean into uh, as a digital native, I know for me, it's my social media feed. Um, I'm often, when I'm swiping, being tried, uh, they're, they're trying to sell me a product, um, something that will help my hair grow back. Um, the, the algorithm has me figured out. They know. Um, or maybe they're trying to get me to cook a certain meal. They know that I love food, especially food that looks good. So if they can even present a dish that looks good, I'm probably going to watch that video and be like, I would like to make this. Um, or maybe some of the, the easier stuff of the voices that I hear on my social media timeline, uh, and this is sort of the brain rot that I get into, it's, it has to do with sports. So it's talking about the Colts or it's talking about the Celtics. Uh, it's talking about fantasy football, who to trade, who to cut, who to sit, who to start. Um, those are the voices that it's easy for me to tune into and to listen to. And while it's easy for me to hear those voices, as we've gotten closer to this election, it's been more and more difficult to hear voices. I've tried really hard to keep uh, all the political talk out of my algorithm, <laughs> but as we get closer and closer, it's become more and more difficult to keep those voices out of my ears. And, and those, those voices often lead me to feel fearful. They lead me to feel anxious. Uh, they lead me to feel hopeless. And um, sometimes, if you can mix in a little, if the right voice can mix in maybe some faith with their political talk, it can often lead to maybe how Amos's original audience felt that judgment is coming. The political voices that we often hear, it can lead us to feel that if our candidate or if our side doesn't win, God's punishment and God's judgment will then be coming as a result. And so to start this morning, uh, if this, this hasn't really set in, I want to read a couple of quotes 
to you guys, maybe just to, to set the stage for us. And then after I read these quotes, that's when I want to dig into our passage of Amos and see where his words meet us in our context today. Because I think Amos, how he closes his book, is really relevant and really practical, especially for this time of the year. And so these quotes that I'm going to read, I'm not going to read who said them. Uh, I don't think we need that. Um, uh, but uh, we don't need to feel more tense or more anxious about them. And, uh, so we'll just, we'll just jump right in. So the first quote is, civilization as we know it is on the line. So remember, these are quotes uh, that I get from the voices sometimes that I, I hear, maybe unintentionally. Next one, we are very close to World War III. Third, criminals are running wild in our cities and the whole world is up in flames. Next, they're going to come after pastors and people of faith like you have never seen. Next, I think our country is going to cease to exist. This could be the last election that we ever have. Next, if we elect Donald Trump, we may feel the effects not for years, not for a generation. We may read our mistakes in the geological record for a million years. Next, if Kamala wins, America will be flooded with 50 million illegal immigrants stealing our jobs and spreading a massive crime wave across the country. Now, if those comments, those extreme, I feel like, comments, if those don't make your skin crawl a little bit or maybe tense up a little bit, maybe ask your neighbor to check your pulse. Um, because I know when I hear them, it's hard. Even just reading them on stage is like, like that was the hardest part in my notes here. So I'm glad, like, that's how I feel. So, um, But when you hear these voices, these extreme voices, um, it leaves us wondering, where's hope found? Where can we find hope? Because as humans, and because we're, we're prone to sin, because we're broken, I don't need any help to feel any more hopeless. That is a part of my, my brokenness, is this tendency to feel hopeless. And the voices are often intensified, are the voices often intensify that feeling of hopelessness. And so again, before we get into this passage, where is hope found? And I think we have to wrestle with that even as followers of Jesus. Where do we find hope in the midst of all that is going on? Because it feels like if we listen to the wrong voices, it seems like it can all come crashing down in an instant. And so this leads us to Amos chapter 9, what Brett read for us this morning. And what I would like to do before I read it again for us is I would just like to invite you, if you're able and willing, to please stand for the, the public reading of God's word. Amos concludes his message to the northern kingdom with this. He says, In that day, I will restore the fallen house of David, and I will repair its damaged walls. From the ruins, I will rebuild it and restore its former glory. And Israel will possess what is left of Eden and all the nations I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken, and he will do these things. Verse 13. The time will come, says the Lord, when the grain and grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Then the terraced vineyards on the hills of Israel will drip with sweet wine, and I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands, and they will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again. They will plant vineyards and gardens. They will eat their crops and drink their wine, and I will firmly plant them there in their own land. They will never again be uprooted from the land that I have given them. Thus saith the Lord. You guys can be seated. After eight and a half chapters of prophetic warning and judgment and vision, Amos leaves his audience with a vision of hope. And I want to break this passage down into two parts to help us see where we can find hope today. And it starts with the first two verses. 
when Amos says this, in that day I will restore the fallen house of David, I will repair its damaged walls. From the ruins I will rebuild it and restore its former glory, and Israel will possess what is left of Edom and all the nations that I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken, and he will do these things. It's important to remember, it's essential, I would argue, to remember the cultural context, the original audience, when we read this passage, because God's chosen people, like I said at the beginning, they have been brought out of Egypt, they've entered into a covenant relationship with God at Mount Sinai, they've gone and established their own nation in the promised land, they've now split off into two separate kingdoms, the north and the south. And it's the north where Amos is speaking. And Amos ends his prophetic ministry talking about a restored house of David. Right there in verse 11. And that's interesting because the Davidic line of kings, if you were to follow David's lineage, it goes from David to Solomon. And then after Solomon, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the kingdom splits And the Davidic line of kings really only stays in the southern kingdom where Amos is from and where Jerusalem is. And if you read through the book of Kings, you'll notice that the northern kingdom soon becomes this big mess of kings and families vying for power. And it's no longer David's line who sits on the throne. And it's important to remember or to notice that that Amos is talking about a king from David's line that's going to be restoring, that's going to be bringing hope because it's this idea of God bringing back his two kingdoms under the unified king. It's important to remember what what David as king received his promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7 when Nathan the prophet uh, got this vision from God and then relayed it to David. It says in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 11, furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, David, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. If he sins, I will correct and discipline him with the rod like any father would do. But my favor will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from your sight. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. And so Nathan went back to David and told him everything that the Lord had said to him in his vision. Amos's final words, his final words of hope and of promise, they're tapping into this idea of the promised king of David that would one day come and rule for aim, uh, forever. And Amos is choosing to remind Israel that despite the coming judgment, despite the Assyrian empire on the horizon, hope is on the other side. And so hold on to that. Remember that while you're in exile. And that hope is rooted in the messianic promise, the promise of a future king. And we know on this side of the cross that that promise gets fulfilled in Jesus. God's voice throughout scripture, it's one of bringing back and restoring creation to himself. It's one of unifying his people, no matter how divided they may appear calling his people to then go and to be a blessing to the world around them. And God promises that that kingdom, that kingdom will be ruled and reigned by a king that comes from David's line, which Jesus claims to be. And so when I think about the unified people of God, it's the church. It's us. I find it helpful to remember how us specifically here at Markle Church of Christ, this idea of unity, how that is central to our identity, not just at Markle, but our movement of churches. You may or may not know this, but Markle Church of Christ, we come from a movement of churches called the Restoration Movement. And the Restoration Movement, uh, it was born out of a time in history, um, late 18th century, uh, early 19th century, called the Second Great Awakening. Second Great Awakening. And as as a church, we can trace our origins back to two men, Barton Stone and Alexander Campbell. 
And together, these two men, one from America, one from Ireland, they came together and they established this movement of churches built on the idea of a New Testament faith and unity. They were tired of uh, all the creeds and things that you had to agree to to become a part of a church. And so they held on to only a few central doctrines and they advocated for liberty in what they called non-essentials. Restoration movement churches like Markle Church of Christ, they find Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 as central to their identity. And as a church, we find what Jesus prayed for, specifically in verse 21, uh, 20 and 21, central to who we are as a church. When Jesus says this, he says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever, ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be one, that they will be unified, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may they be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Some of the central mantras to our movement of churches are no creed but Christ. Another one, we are not the only Christians, but we are Christians only. We want to be one that the world may be one. And then my personal favorite, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, love. As followers of Jesus, we seek to prioritize this call or this longing for unity as people of Jesus. And in a culture of partisanship and politics, it's easy to listen to voices that want to divide us. But unity under the reign and rule of Jesus, it crosses political boundaries of our day just as much as it did in the time of Jesus when he called two people like Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot, two people who are on opposite extreme ends politically but brought them together under his kingdom. And so thinking about our question this morning, where is hope found? Where is it? Where do we find hope today? I think it's in our desire and our pursuit of unity under what Amos calls the house of David. It's in Jesus that we find unity and it's where we find hope as his bride, the church. The pursuit of unity is one of many ways that we say yes to following Jesus. I always tell our students, saying yes to Jesus or following Jesus, being a disciple, it's one big yes followed by a thousand little yeses every day. Our pursuit of unity and seeking to, to bridge the gap, so to say, that's one little way that we can say yes to Jesus. And so where is hope found? I think hope is found in unity. Hope is found in the unified church of God. Amos's vision for hope and restoration, it's, it's built on this idea of a unified people under the lordship of Jesus Christ, empowered by his Holy Spirit. And we only come to that reality when the voices that we tune, tune into, we maybe turn down a little bit and we tune into the most, God's voice. In a culture of a thousand voices, the voice of God must supersede all other voices that we hear. Where is hope found? It's found in unity. And I would say that unity is found in God's voice. And if we're going to become lifelong followers of Jesus, or people who seek to say yes to Jesus in a thousand different ways every day, we have to pursue unity amongst our brothers and our sisters. We cannot succumb to the patterns of this world, to, to divisiveness. Uh, we can't let the voices that we hear pit us against the people that we're sitting next to right now. When I think about what unity can look like today, I think about how we just took communion, how we came up and we received the bread and the juice. We, we set aside the things that may divide us. It doesn't matter who we are or what we've done or where you've been or who you're going to vote for or not vote for. Everyone is welcome at the table of Jesus, and he sees you at that table as his child. I also think about the first song that we sang this morning. I think it was the first, first time we sang it, Up From the Waters. 
a song that reminds us of our baptism, a song that reminds us of our willingness to say no to me, less of me, dying to myself and being raised to new life in Jesus and acknowledging him as the one true king and the one that we submit and live under the reign and rule. Hope is found in unity. Unity is found in God's voice. And as we wrap up this morning, God's voice restores creation. Let's look at that second half of Amos, starting in verse 13. He says this, The time will come, says the Lord, when the grain and grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Then the terraced vineyards on the hills of Israel will drip with sweet wine, and I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands, and they will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again. They will plant vineyards and gardens. They will eat their crops and drink their wine. And I will firmly plant them there in their own land. And they will never again be uprooted from the land that I have given them, says the Lord. When we choose to live into our, identi our, our identity as a unified people of Jesus, creation begins to be restored. These final words of Amos, these are Eden images. This is creation acting and behaving as it was intended prior to the fall, prior to sin entering into the world. The laborious process to produce food or fruit from the ground, it no longer requires our hard work. Instead, it's bountiful and it flows from the mountains. We no longer have to live in conflict with the land and those around us. Instead, God's generosity is providing and sustaining us. And more so, hope is filled with the image of coming back from exile, returning back to the land that God promised for his people. Remember, the first audience that would have read this or heard this, they were sitting in Assyria as exiles, maybe on the outside of the city, uh, working sun up to sun down, uh, just, just trying to survive. And so when they hear these words of Amos, they end with this message of hope. And for us, as followers of Jesus on this side of the cross, I think that we can, despite what our world looks like now, or what it will look like in two weeks, or two months, or two years, or two decades, we can have hope that God is working to restore his creation. We can have hope that God is working to bring it back to his original intent. It is hard to be hopeful. It is hard to hold on to hope, and we can sometimes lose sight of where we find it. But let me remind you this morning of the good news of Jesus. And that because of him, hope is possible and we can find it and we can have access to it today. While judgment seems to be all around us, while the world seems to be chaotic, confusing, fearful, we can remember, we can hold on to the hope that we are a people bought with the precious blood of Jesus who can come together and be unified around a table that we can live lives empowered by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, and we can go out into a world that is broken, that is hurting, that has fallen apart, and we can be agents of hope to a world that is watching. The Holy Spirit it empowers us to put on hope, to wear hope at our jobs, in our homes, in our schools, in our families. And I think that if we're going to be a people of hope, it starts with pursuing unity under the lordship of Jesus, and that it's found when we listen to God's voice because of what God has spoken is true. And what he spoke 2,700 years ago to the people of Israel through the prophet Amos, it's still true, and it's still something for us to hold on to today. And we see it through the lens of the cross. We see it through Jesus, the son of David. When we listen to God's voice, we can be reminded of God's sovereignty 
that even though it feels like he's absent or he's not, he's not here, he's not working for us like we would expect, he is in control. He does hear us, he does see us, and he is deeply involved and cares for us. He hears you, he longs to be in relationship with you, and he is ultimately in control. It's just up to us to trust and to obey him while we wait. We become people of hope. We become the people of hope we were created to be when we listen to God's voice. And so when you find yourself asking, where is hope found? I hope that you will remind yourself that hope is found in you. You are the agent of hope, empowered by the Holy Spirit that God wants to use in his creation. Jesus wants to use you to bring hope to a sometimes hopeless world. And let me encourage you with this. The most frequent command in the Bible is do not be afraid. And so as you go into your week, as you go into a voting poll, as you go into your schools, as you go into your jobs, do not be afraid. Instead, be filled with the hope of Jesus, trusting and listening to his voice over and above all the other voices that we can sometimes tune into. Would you pray with me? God, sometimes it's good just to sit in silence and to just try to listen for your voice. And so, Father, I pray that as we wrap up this series through the book of Amos, as we conclude maybe listening to his voice, I pray that we would be encouraged by the hope that he offers. And, Father, I pray that we would come to realize that hope, hope is found in you and through us. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit would work in and through us this week to be agents of hope wherever it is that we may find ourselves, to be a people of unity, to be a people of love, because we know that when we participate in those things, that you are working to restore your creation just as you intended it to be. Father, may we not forget the moments like communion and baptism, fellowship and, and your word. May they be beacons that we can remember your goodness and your love and your hope when life gets difficult, when life gets overwhelming, when it feels like there's maybe no end in sight. And so as we sing this last song, Father, I pray uh, that these words would just be sung to you and that we would be able to hold on to the truths that we're proclaiming and that we're singing and that we would be able to take them out into our weeks. It's in your son, Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.